thank you everybody for joining us this evening, um, for sharing uh, time with us. Uh, this is the latest in our artists and inspiration series of programming. And I am once again, Laura Rice, the chief curator at the Adirondack Experience. We'd like to start by acknowledging that the Adirondack Experience is situated on the Aboriginal territories of the Mohawk and Abenaki communities. Indigenous people continue to live in this region and practice their teachings and life ways. So in just over eight months, the museum will open its first major exhibition devoted to Adirondack art and design called Artist and Inspiration in the Wild. This speaker series will continue over the coming months, touching on topics and artists featured in that exhibition. Hope that you will continue to join us as we go forward with this. This evening, I am delighted to introduce Mr. Jim Bodner. He is, was an architect with the firm of Skidmore, Owings and Merrill for 17 years before establishing his own practice uh, some 32 years ago. He also has served on the board of the American Academy of Rome where he was a fellow and has served as president of their alumni association. Jim has deep connections to the Adirondacks. His wife in fact serves as vice chair of the Adirondack Experience Board of Trustees and together they have spent the last 40 summers at Bartlett Carey on Upper Saranac Lake. Please feel free throughout the program to submit any questions you might have through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. We will be recording this evening's program and it will be available through the museum's website uh, sometime later this week. So with further ado, I will turn it over to Mr. Bodner. Thank you, Laura. So I want to start by first saying thank you to the um, experience, the Adirondack experience for putting this together tonight and, and asking me to, if you will, to host the conversation. Um, partly because um, I should tell you right off that one of the participants, Michael Bird, is not able to join us tonight because of a personal matter that came up suddenly. So we'll miss him tonight. But the other two participants, Niels Lugarowski and uh, Rich Hampeter, I've known for many years, in fact, almost that entire 40 year period, I've been going to the Adirondacks and I've gotten to be close friends with them. So to include them in the conversation tonight is a very personal one and one I look forward to, uh, forward to now for some time. The format tonight is very simple. It will follow um, with my giving an introduction to both of the two architects. And then it will follow with Neil uh, actually showing a few slides of things to begin the conversation of, about um, the architecture of the Adirondacks and its origins and his perspective of it. And then I'll turn it over to Rich to follow that. And then what will follow after that are questions that either I have put together or we hope we receive from all of you. Uh, so please send them those questions in. We'll go through the list and try to cover as much as we can in the hour we have available to us now. So with no, more, no further ado, Neil Zlitorowski, um, originally is from Sweden. And he studied at Pratt University, or Pratt Institute of Art and Design in Brooklyn, where he incorporated many aspects of the architectural movements, American architectural movements, such as the craftsman, as well as the prairie style into his developing aesthetic. In the mid 1990s, he relocated to Keene, where he lived with his family and his work can be found throughout the mountains and lakes, which we'll see in a few photos coming up. But certainly it's, it is an Adirondack architecture not to be forgotten. Rich Hampeter was raised in North Creek and moved to Saranac Lake in 1984. Rich integrates many in the varied um, historic styles of the Adirondack vernacular with a more contemporary touch. Um, he studied at the University of Notre Dame and then went on to get his master's degree in architecture at the University of Illinois. So without further ado, Niels, would you like to begin? Um, <clears throat> yes, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna go a little bit of backwards here and I will request the following slides in, the, in this specific order. Uh, one and um, two is the same thing. So it's one and two, seven, nine, 13 and 16 and they all cover the same subject.
Excellent, thank you. <clears throat> so, You're working so I, long and so late. I was, uh, excuse me, I, <clears throat> I was born in, in the US and uh, moved eventually to Sweden with my mother and uh, <clears throat> came back at, um, in the late 60s and went to Pratt. <clears throat> I was initially not an architecture student. What influenced me early on when I started thinking about architecture was not based on uh, any sort of name or any particular history, except that when I grew up in Sweden, I <clears throat> knew, uh, or everybody of, of all classes had a summer house of sorts, very modest, sometimes very large, some, some, sometimes <clears throat> some based on Swiss, Austrian, um, Bavarian architecture, some just based on the need to add of a very, onto a very small building. And this slide explains where I got most excited early on. Um, I'd started building a house, and at the time I was not a licensed architect. And uh, my wife was going to be a guide uh, at the uh, Olympics in 1980. And we had a field visit at this place, the Lake Placid Club, which is a private club on Lake Placid in New York. <clears throat> this illustrates what happens when you need more, more functions and therefore more buildings in sort of an unplanned way. Later on, when I was deeper into my studies, I realized this doesn't come from just here. It also comes from <clears throat> differences in construction methods. Um, once we gave up on, on um, uh, timber framing and similar kind of framing and the nature uh, in the mills produ produced, um, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, dimensional lumber, you could really build anything you wanted out of wood. And that's what you see in early Victorian times and forward. So anything is possible in wood. And that's what this is. 1980, and last terribly long, but it was, was founded in the 1880s and eventually was, uh, <clears throat> I believe, accidentally burned down by uh, late 80s, 80, 1980s. Uh, slide seven, please. So I'm, I'm waiting for you. Slide seven. Sorry, I'm just having a connection issue. I'll pull it up in just a moment. It's okay. <clears throat> I apologize for my voice. It's gotten a great hit in the end of the summer here. Well, while we're waiting for a moment, Neil, I was gonna ask Rich, <clears throat> could you touch upon your thoughts about the which we consider like the origins of the Adirondack architecture. And I, I bring this up because it probably starts, it's kind of like a primitive form, which is like, like the lane to, I guess would be the earliest form of Adirondack architecture that we consider to be, if you will, indigenous to our environment. Would you just touch on where you think it went from there to evolve into what is now considered a complete style of its own? Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, I think a lot of uh, what has evolved over the years, uh, commencing with uh, something as simple as a lean-to or even uh, rudimentary hunting camps, uh, was uh, benefited from the, the folks who were building them were folks who tended to travel extensively. Uh, so they traveled throughout the US, they saw a number of styles, 
in forms throughout the country. And there's specific elements that come from pretty much every region of the US. Uh, certainly, uh, there's strong influence, uh, uh, Japanese influence, uh, Bavarian, uh, German, Swiss, things of that nature, as, as Niels noted. Um, sometimes it's, it's a bit overlooked, but there, there are some things from Canada uh, that showed up here uh, in that uh, they used peeled logs, bark on logs, um, the stonework uh, that they used was not the, the rounded uh, kind of boulder stonework that came from the Rockies, uh, but more of a flat stonework uh, that was used in Quebec, but also a lot in Northern Ontario, uh, split face stone, flat mortar joints, and it, it really reflects on a, a French influence. Um, one of the few French influences that seem to show up here. So the, the clients and the builders uh, through reading, through pamphlets, which were popular, popular in the era, uh, folks would see uh, types of construction. They would like it, bring it back and say, I would like this sort of form integrated into my summer home in the Adirondacks. Uh, so, you know, from the East Coast, uh, certainly uh, a lot of Atlantic shore homes, uh, shingle style porches uh, started to work their way into uh, the, the language and our vernacular here. Um, you know, from the, the Southeast wraparound porches and then, you know, pergolas, trellises integrating into the outdoor spaces started to happen. From the Rockies, uh, heavier timber uh, heavier log work, bigger scale, and you started to see a lot of heavy timber or log raftering with exposed rafter tails. Well, that was a necessity because of their heavier snow loads, but folks really gravitated towards that appearance. So that started to show up more uh, in, a, in our region. Uh, from the Pacific Northwest, uh, the use of cedar, uh, split granite, um, and some broader open spaces uh, started to work their way in. Um, so it's, you know, initially folks want, you know, sought out a summer home, uh, some relief from the heat of the city or from the south. In Saranac Lake, uh, people sought refuge here for health reasons. Uh, so it's, you know, the dissemination of information or design styles uh, was strongly related to uh, the travels that uh, many folks did. Thank you. And Neil, I got another question for you <clears throat> while we're waiting for a slide. Is the, um, could you go through and just outline how we have the style, so-called style. Oh, here, good. Why don't you pick it up here with your, your slide? <laughs> okay. This is an example of, we have now, thank you, Rich. That was a very good. Uh, no time resume of the whole thing. We don't need to talk anymore. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so this is an example of a client who had summered in, in uh, one of the moose lakes for, I don't know, 30, 40 years, who wanted something that had looked like there for, been there for <clears throat> at least 100 years. So this building, or well, this is an addition, and the addition was addition to a uh, about a 60 by 100 foot shed built very poorly, so poorly you really could not build on top of the existing foundations here because the existing foundations were not supportive. So what we did here, we built a series of footings around the building and manage to uh, sort of bridge the building on every level and add the, <clears throat> for my client, appropriate detail. Um, and the connection between the uh, Lake Placid Club, you can clearly see so this is an ad hoc kind of approach. And I think that in Victorian days, Queen Anne buildings were built according to their function and looked like 
they were expressing the function. And I think that's what has happened up here. Even the older great camps have, <clears throat> have um, sort of evolved on that level. I've done a major addition to North Point Camp in Racket Lake, which was Lucy Carnegie's great camp. But I worked in the style of the original architect, but it's still additions to an older building. Neil, I was going to ask you, um, actually, before the slide came out, I was going to ask you to talk through the evolution and what is a great camp. Many people probably have never been to one or seen one. And if you could um, you know, just clarify what is a great camp and how they evolve functionally and, and practically over time. I will hand that over to Richard, I think. <laughs> some, uh, some, some could mention there are only seven great camps. You know, where does it stop and when is it great? Is it great art or is it not art, but just great? Or I great? think it's, a, it's in the mind of the owner. <laughs> yeah. Um, you it's a, it, it's what, curious. Go ahead. No, no, I was gonna say, do you wanna take that question? Is Neil well, bounce it over to you? Sure. Um, uh, again, it's, uh, I think uh, in, the, in many folks' minds, they think of a, a great hall uh, or a massive lodge uh, that you would see typically in the Rockies. Uh, that scale didn't occur here at the outset. Uh, it's certainly happening now. Uh, and in limited examples, as Niels noted uh, previously. Uh, the thing that uh, conceptually, uh, in my mind, uh, uh, describes the, the great camp is uh, there's a main structure, a primary structure. Uh, but then with that on the property, there are a number of ancillary structures uh, so that uh, there's a, there may be the main lodge, uh, which typically would have a, a big dining area, potentially uh, some sleeping areas and kitchen. Although uh, in order to uh, accommodate with addition after addition after addition, as families grew or extended families started to use the properties, there were sleeping cottages and uh, guest houses um, and a number of them. And sometimes they were connected by a simple mulched pathway or sometimes uh, uh, covered connectors. Uh, but the, you know, so that was done, it provided privacy. It also provided great fire protection so that if there was a fire in one of the structures, uh, the laundry building or the kitchen building or a maintenance building, it didn't spread and take an entire camp because they were probably unoccupied for the bulk of the year. So it also provided privacy, uh, provided uh, cooler environments so that the heat and smells from a kitchen didn't permeate through the entire spaces. You know, it's real nuts and bolts, practical things, but I always viewed great camps as more of a campus than a single structure. And uh, that's something that's uh, very strong, again, in Canada, uh, where uh, zoning wise, let's say uh, in Georgian Bay on the islands uh, there, you, you were only ever allowed zoning wise, and this goes back to the turn of the century, to have a single large residence and you could have uh, three smaller residents that were 45 square meters. And to this day, that's the pattern language that gets used. Interesting. Uh, Neil, you actually said that you were from a interior design background originally. I wonder if you can touch on the relationship between the interior architecture of the Adirondack style and the exterior of the buildings. Because they seem like they can be distinctly different at times. Well, <clears throat> uh, touching on what I said earlier, uh, I think that visually, um, you may not like Victorian architecture, but certainly um, Queen Anne is sort of cleaning up the act a little bit 
giving a lot more freedom and getting rid of the frill, although the frill never went away and came back in different ways. <clears throat> I studied interior design in Sweden uh, because I didn't like architecture school because it, they started backwards with math where I really wanted to start with design. So that was six weeks. And, um, and then, uh, so I gave up on the whole idea of staying in Sweden and moved to, to the US at that time. Uh, <clears throat> then I <clears throat> had a client at Parsons University who had a lot uh, that needed development uh, at the Crater Club on Lake Champlain. And uh, that was kind of a crazy opportunity for me, first to get to know buildings that had built, built modestly in the 1880s, though I shouldn't really mention anything after 1940 up there, uh, but <clears throat> sort of started with studying these things and what they look like and how the exterior envelope meant something to my clients. And what they were really looking at there was the sort of the glowing embers of the great campus in many ways, except that nobody anymore could foot the bill uh, <clears throat> for the great camps, uh, tax-wise, construction-wise, or anything. And I would say the last of the really great camps were were, uh, were done with by 1918-20. They still exist. I worked on many of them, um, but they're not built that way. And I think that going back to <clears throat> interior design, I think the exterior of the building ought to, ought to look like <clears throat> what's going on inside. And that's really what Victoria and Queen Anne buildings did. It was more difficult to deal with architecture back in the days when the framing noted uh, how the building should look like. I have recently finished a, a, I should say, a facsimile of the, of the Wyth building in Colonial Williamsburg. <clears throat> and, um, I, I bought all the books about colonial architecture because I knew nothing about colonialism. And then I found out that everything is colonialism in America, <clears throat> or refer to it. But when I realized how difficult it was, was to put a modern, modern function in a conventional shell with all the restrictions that a, uh, uh, that kind of uh, design, uh, building design uh, was. So hence, uh, my newer buildings are much more mannered, sometimes not so mannered as what you see here. Uh, but I manage these days because of budget restrictions, carefully incorporate the needs of the interior of the buildings into my buildings. Sometimes just by excavating, if you wish, parts of the exterior to make it more of this three-dimensional kind of feeling built for purpose. And uh, Rich, um, could you address the, and I know Michael uh, Bird would, would like to be here to actually answer this, and he and I talked about it. You know, it's very challenging to take one of these old structures from over 100 years ago, especially a great camp, which had many structures, and renovate them for modern use. That is with contemporary heating, water systems, electronics, and everything that you have today, and still not compromise the appearance and the feel of the building. And you've done a number of projects similar to that. Could you just talk about the challenges that come out from taking an old structure and making it so-called new again? Certainly. Um, keeping in mind that many of these uh, camps, uh, great camps or more modest versions were intended for summer use only. Uh, the framing in them was incredibly light. Rafters are seem uh, comically small to us when we take a look at them. But uh, during the course of the winter, uh, there were snow poles put up under ridges and uh, temporary supports put in so that the structure could withstand the winter. So now nobody wants to use them just in the summer. Everybody, uh, for good reason, wants to be able to use their properties year round. So in order to keep the forms and the scale 
uh, to what uh, is needed, uh, that becomes a, a, a difficulty. Uh, some of these camps, when you get underneath them and you get the raccoons out of the way, uh, you find that uh, what the foundation system in some of them uh, were just uh, several wife or layers of stone uh, set on, on bare earth, probably not even compacted. Some of them, uh, you can see they, they just used an alcohol line level, cut the trees down and use the stumps as the piers. So that's a tough one. Um, so you need to hold the, the buildings in place in some instances, uh, needle underneath them, uh, put in support and, and put in a, a proper footing, frost wall, whatever it may take uh, in order to sustain the, the building and to protect the investment that's being built on it and added to it. Um, uh, the, it's, uh, it's the materials we have available to us now make it significantly easier to do. Um, and, you know, routing uh, piping and waistlines and venting uh, is always tough, uh, sometimes even in new construction. Uh, but when you have very slender walls, uh, you, you don't have the chaseways available. So Neil, do you have more slides? How many do you want to see? <laughs> oh, look, at least one should more. I switch, should I switch from old to new? Okay. I, I still, uh, that was Panther Point. Uh, I, th I think I'll... You know, the great thing about the, much of the Adirondacks, even though you think these buildings are in the mountain, but the many of them, most of the great camps are on water. Yeah. And the first, the first thing you view when you approach a camp, because you're only going to approach it by boat in many cases in the old days, is yep. the boathouse. And we've done a, quite a few in Rich Hag. Can you just talk about what is a boathouse in, in the Adirondacks and how the vernacular works? And, and maybe Top Ridge is the classic ultimate one. Yeah, I don't show any boathouses here. Uh, well, that's, just to talk through what a boathouse has and could have, because they were more, much more than just a, a garage for a boat. Well, absolutely. It was, it was another, you know, if the Johnson showed up with a new Oldsmobile Delta 88, you had to outdo them next season. <clears throat> so many of these buildings were, were, if not most, were kind of trophy buildings. The... Uh, just to sedge back here a little bit, the the racket, the racket Lake camp on the uh, <clears throat> called North Point. Uh, when we started uh, looking into the you know what kind of materials we were going to use and how we're going to design it, we discovered uh, we brought back all the uh, uh, original architects' drawings for the museum somewhere in, near Portland, um, <clears throat> and. Um, and that was then. So it doesn't really look what it is, as what what Peter uh, that was Rich said before. So it looks like square hewn logs was just two by sixes, and there there are corner blocks everywhere, and they were independently toenailed onto to this structure. And she had, she had just ordered her carpenters to build it over the summer, so that's what they did. Uh, it is totally illegal, substandard construction, but it looks good. So that's what I did too. And uh, <clears throat> so, so that's what that is. And then, of course, that camp had over 40 outbuildings in its heyday. <clears throat> so I think the boathouse is a showcase for the boat uh, more than anything else not only the house, but the boats inside and the interiors of the house. Some of them grow, uh, grew to be very, very large buildings, very, very nicely finished. Uh, Bristol varnish and all sorts of kind of stuff, but um, weren't used very much, but they were display cases. And just one of other kind of things, you had to have a casino, you had an ice house, you had service <coughs> houses, you have a hunter's house, you have a, you know, and um, yeah, uh, it's just another toy.
in the compound, the LIGO, LIGO count compound. That's not done anymore because you can't. I don't think that people pay enough for what they want. Um, yeah. How, how have you seen, and not just your practice, but how have you seen, um, because most of, uh, you, you might say that there's somewhat derivative styles of, of Adirondack architecture, that we look to ones that we really like and we not really copy it, but we emulate it. Um, how have you seen styles evolving in the Adirondacks? Because we they're definitely moving away from a great camp. We're now into these, quote, lodges, the way Rich pointed out earlier, um, which lends itself to a different kind of architecture. And when it was smaller buildings and a cluster of buildings. Because I think back then it was actually the, the professional architecture was not prevalent throughout the Adirondacks. That is, you didn't have a lot of architectural officers designing these buildings with drawings and getting them built. But they were craftsmen, basically, who toured around and had skill sets that, um, like this building in front of us, uh, represented the, the artisans, the, the, the builders. I think that's evolved over the last, you know, 15 or 20 or two or three decades into the bigger lodges. Yeah, I think everybody wanted a, a great lodge, whatever they think that is. <clears throat> but in, in reality, that's not possible. If you, but if you go back to the Howards Club and North Club, uh, Northwoods Club and all that stuff, they all started as modest buildings that were added on to. Uh, and then they were eventually torn down when somebody could build a better, bigger building, but it was more modest. And this, but this didn't happen until it became truly popular to go beyond the sort of the typical, what everybody thinks, uh, and, and it is the beginning of the uh, camp, C-A-M-P, as in hunting camp, which, which was really, not even on the platform in the beginning, it was just a tent and then raised up because of a convenience and it went from there. So but Rich, another, part, yeah. another question for Rich is that you, you, the really great buildable sites, there aren't very many left. That is access to, to them are getting, to building sites are getting harder. The, um, the regulations are more difficult. Could you go through some of the issues that come up if you were to plan a new camp or a new major structure in the location in the Adirondacks today? I know septic is one. I know fire regulation is another, required setbacks. But as a practitioner, what do you see as your critical issues? Oh, sure. Um, uh, we find that there is a greater segment of the budget needs to be devoted to site development than ever before. Uh, you don't get to uh, drive to the site on what was a, a fairly well-improved logging road, uh, bring in materials and get to work. We find that we're, we're building roads and of significant length. Uh, we're dealing with sites that have steeper grades, uh, um, far more uh, greater prevalence of ledge and erratics. You know, the big boulders you find as soon as you put a shovel in the ground. Uh, those uh, anymore, well, there were times where we would, we would blast. Now it's, uh, we drill and use compounds and split the rock. So you don't even hear it. It happens overnight. You come back in the morning and uh, things are split. Uh, we find that we have to pay far more attention and invest more money in dewatering sites. Uh, the sites that are now available were the ones that uh, were not wetlands, but there was uh, large tributary areas of drainage running through them. So that in order to do the excavation and put in footings, frost walls, foundation walls, uh, but we have to dewater it, pump it out before we even put in compacted stone and, and start building from there. Uh, fortunately, there are better uh, materials now for drainage piping uh, that make that possible. Uh, with septic systems, there's far greater, better technology uh, for absorption beds and lift systems to, to create safe and durable uh, septic systems. A lot of the properties that are left available now 
were from older subdivisions that were many, many narrow parcels leading down to the water, usually off of a right of way. So those need to be combined. Uh, so permitting needs to be addressed there uh, in order to accommodate side yard setbacks uh, primarily. The front yard setbacks and, and uh, setbacks from the mean high water level are not, uh, not such a, a tough issue. Uh, it's the side yard setbacks that have emerged and necessitate people purchasing multiple parcels in order to build. So I wonder um, if you could, when you take that line of thinking one step further and, and maybe step on hollow ground here, but the APA controls the regulations and especially with boathouses. So, and, and there's now height restrictions for the boathouses, as you may know, that limits the architectural three-dimensional image from what, um, you know, from what we're used to with no more of a flat roof almost. Correct. Um, it, it's not just the, the, the park agency, um, uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation uh, limits the amount of material whether it's stone filled timber cribs or concrete filled steel pilings uh, that can go in to support the structure to 100 cubic yards. If it goes beyond that, it's no longer a minor project and permitting becomes more difficult. Uh, we have to get everything approved by the US Army Corps of Engineers uh, out of their Albany office as well. But what we've found, and I tend to like it, is uh, we enjoy working with uh, bungalow style, shingle style, green and green style, where there are shallower pitches, uh, longer roof planes, broad overhangs. And that allows us to stay under the mandated height limits. So that's a, a happy uh, coincidence for us because it allows us to uh, do buildings that look more seated in the landscape, or in this case, on a shoreline. And it doesn't generate a billboard effect that blocks the views to other structures behind them, and vice versa from the land, you look over them out to the lake. The locale sometimes have far more stringent uh, zoning uh, requirements than the park agency. Interesting. Uh, what many people probably don't realize that when we talk about a boathouse, we're actually talking about a building in the water or sitting Correct. in the water and that you, there may be a bridge or a walkway that leads you out there. But essentially, you're taking away parts of the lake, in, in essence, which is why there's such a sensitivity about it. And, um, and it, if there were a boathouse there at one time, you could probably rebuild the boathouse you, on the you, old privy. You can, but you can't build a boathouse now uh, that gets approval from uh, DEC unless it is away from the shoreline. You can't build into the shoreline. So you, as you say, you bridge out to it. Uh, their thinking is you have to allow a free flow of water along the shoreline for fish. They limit the size of structures because they want to limit the amount of shading of the lake bed. Uh, so that the wharf areas are always significantly larger than the underpinnings because we can now span greater lengths. But uh, those, uh, the footprint issues are all a function of environmental ecological concerns. Do you, uh, Neil, do you, um, could you talk more about um, the exterior architecture of these buildings, Adirondack style buildings? And what are the major features that you think people should look at and identify as critical to putting together the style? Whether it's the cornice, the ridge lines, the shingles, the material, the shapes, the curves or bow windows, whatever. What are some of the aspects that you think make up the quality of Adirondack architecture? Well, I wouldn't say make up the qualities of the Adirondack architecture, I will say my version of the Adirondack architecture is I'm trying to, because you have clients with egos, you're trying to make them feel good about <laughs> they're going to spend some time. And was it you or Rich who mentioned that with a 15 foot uh, 
ridge height from, uh, I believe it is from, depending on which town you are, from top of dock or, or mean high water, doesn't give you much to work with with any size boat. I have done some really weird uh, trusses that are, there are more scissor than scissors ever could be just to accommodate um, boats like uh, <clears throat> pontoon boats and the likes. But I still think it ought to be graceful. And I think that has to do with materials. And I'm obsessed with scale always of everything that goes into a building. And there, there are things that people relate to naturally. Th things have for hundreds, thousands of years related to a given size of a door or a window and the manipulation of those kind of things. I'd like to maintain that when I do boat houses as well, but they do need a character giving element from time to time. And um, when the building itself can't sort of conform to that, I have my few kind of tricks. One of them is the eyebrow window. Uh, but that's also functional. You want to ventilate the interior. And with, with uh, shoe buildings these days, that <clears throat> for those who use expensive interior materials, you are subject to condensation very often. So you have, have to have vented envelopes. And, and uh, with a garage door, you all of a sudden need a place in the upper region to ventilate the space itself. So a lot of that stuff ties together a little bit. Now, would you say the arts and if there were one or two movements, what would you recommend people look back at for sources like the arts and crafts movement or the prairie movement like you've used before? What would be the styles that we all know um, that were alive at that time throughout the country and, and in Europe and places? Well, I think the <clears throat> Queen Anne um, would be the sort of the um, baseline in many ways. But, and out of that came, of course, craftsmen, uh, bungalow and all that sort of thing, which again was um, people wanted more detail, more, more quote unquote quality in design. And, and back then you, you uh, architects designed a lot of work for builders and the builders were skilled and hired the right architects for a while. That it doesn't exist anymore. And um, where do you think it's going in the future? The Adirondack style, because <laughs> it, could, it, it, it could, as every style, it has its time and its place and it evolves and changes, but it keeps moving or it's, it becomes stale, as you know. And, <clears throat> well, and if you, you and Rich could both try that one, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> Rich, you first. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I tend to think that uh, shingle style, craftsman style, uh, and to some extent green and green style from Pasadena area in California will emerge in, in years going forward as the more buildable and pleasing styles to use. Uh, and people I think will probably gravitate away from, you know, the big, um, you know, basketball size stone uh, walls and fireplaces and, um, you know, uh, bark architecture kinds of things. Uh, they're in, they're very labor intensive, and I think uh, the the day of those being the most popular has probably passed. And I think that uh, given the need to comply with New York State Energy Code requirements now and uh, membrane uh, type walls, the um, the use of uh, you know rough sawn pan uh clabbered sidings and shingles things of that nature uh become uh far more reasonable and um we tend to use uh 
a palette of colors that are more muted to greens and blues uh, and more black now uh, and less of uh, the Oxford brown that was uh, used in many areas for, for many years. Um, the, there's a limit to the amount of glass you can use. And while people may want uh, 10 foot high, 16 foot long sliding panels, you can do that, but you have to look at the whole house as a mechanism and it still has to pass uh, the code requirements in terms of energy consumption. But one, one of the things that's happened is uh, because our materials have gotten significantly better, uh, you need far less mechanical space than you used to. You don't need a massive boiler room uh, in order to properly heat a home. Uh, there are far more efficient ways to do it. And, and one thing I'd, I'd like to mention is that Michael and Niels and I have all worked for 30, 40 years with a lot of incredibly skilled uh, craftsmen and women. Uh, and we've, our practices have benefited from their skill and their knowledge. And I've always had just the best relationships and thoroughly enjoyed working with these folks because of the contribution they make to the process and the pride that they take in their work. And at the beginning of the, the great camp era, if you will, it was, it was these people that were the master builders and uh, not architects that were, were really doing uh, the work. They, they were given an image that an, uh, a client or an owner had and they carried it on from there. So uh, we owe an awful lot to them. Thank you. <clears throat> and Neil? Oh, oh, um, what Richard said last here is, I think, very important. Uh, <clears throat> I had my uh, initial years as an architect in New York City, and I remember carrying 60 drawings up to the building department for approval, negotiating with various kind of characters from the New York diaspora. Uh, <clears throat> so I I was well trained uh, also with my Swedish background to do extremely detailed drawings. And those drawings didn't fly very well here uh, because they had never seen anything like that. However, <clears throat> I went to carpentry school for a while in Sweden as well. So I know a thing or two about working with wood. And I think that um, the, the way the old caretakers, craftsmen, you know, parts teams and builders, they knew their way of doing things and adapting their way in the interest of all was very interesting to me. So instead of doing crazy drawings anymore, I very often do sample models of details, finishes and all that sort of thing. And I very much enjoyed that interaction. Niels, or, uh, Niels had mentioned uh, the Tahaz Club and the Northwoods Club. And at a tender age, I did a lot of carpentry work at both of those places uh, with my dad, who was a, a furniture maker and a builder. Um, there are some car the construction firms that I started working with in 1984 and I'm now working with second and third generation family members. That's great. Okay, we've got a few questions here. There's, they're minor, but I'll let you try the first one, um, Rich. Are living spaces allowed in a boathouse? No. No. Can any, yeah. can any occupiable space be in a boathouse besides boats? Uh, you can have uh, open decks, you can have storage, uh, but you cannot have any sleeping spaces. You cannot have any uh, bathroom or kitchen facilities. What about a game room upstairs? You can, but the height limitations 
will force that to be a, a difficult uh, undertaking. Okay, understood. Uh, another question, We, um, a writer um, asked the question, we live in a 1920 small camp with the diamond shaped window panes. Where did that style come from? Uh, Niels could probably answer that better. I know that there were certainly great examples in the Victorian era. Uh, and then going forward from that, uh, I'd like to hear Neil's thought on that. I think it's entirely the Victorian era. Uh, <clears throat> I may have missed it in my travels in Switzerland, but I think the Victorian era was much more <clears throat> dynamic in the US. Much, much more stuff was built and new uh, factory made things that you could buy online to install in your building was very important and very easy to get. So I, I would agree with you. Here's another question. With the Amish moving and building in upstate New York more uh, prevalent these days, do you see them in helping with building in the Adirondacks, taking a role? Uh, I've had great uh, good fortune to work with uh, an incredibly talented Am Amish cabinet maker and uh, have just thoroughly enjoyed all of our dealings uh, with him. Um, I have not worked with uh, general contracting uh, Amish groups. Uh, they certainly are uh, I believe more prevalent uh, around Potsdam, Norwood, Canton, in that area. Uh, another question. Do you think there is any place, I'm gonna let Neil do this one. Do you think there is any place in the Adirondacks for contemporary architecture? And not just contemporary techniques and materials, but the actual design. Absolutely. Neil? Yeah, absolutely. I just can't find any clients who ask for it. Uh, <clears throat> I can still manage scale, color, texture, and make a fully modern building without having to do anything at all. But that's not what people want. I can move to Vermont a little bit. That's an easier sell. They, they care more about energy efficiency, lead, green, and, and uh, all these other kind of energy related movements. And Rich? Oh, I, I agree. Uh, and some of our projects uh, certainly lean more toward uh, contemporary work. Uh, we collaborated with uh, a uh, Quebec City architect recently uh, and did two large contemporary style projects. Uh, in, in this case, they utilized cross laminated timber, which is uh, like dimensional lumber assembled like a sheet of plywood, mm. but they can be uh, 14 feet wide, 60 feet long, and do incredible spans and are used for floors, walls, and roofs. Uh, so th certainly, uh, contemporary design uh, can and should be uh, part of what's going forward. I take issue with uh, someone uh, parking a glass box in the woods and saying that they've paid allegiance to the site and the setting. Uh, they've just imposed what they wanted on that parcel. So uh, editor editorial comment there. Okay, taken. Um, last comment for both of you is that as we see the Adirondack um, uh, architecture primarily being a rural or a country out outside of a city, how does it move forward? And what are the examples of urban Adirondack architecture that we see today in cities such as Saranac Lake or Keene? I try rich sure um i don't think uh, if you're if you're going to look at 
what we are describing as uh, an honest Adirondack rustic vernacular style. Uh, it is uh, intended, I suspect, almost solely for more remote locations and to impose that in uh, villages, hamlets, towns, uh, it becomes very difficult. Uh, historically, uh, they were Victorian style buildings on main streets. Um, so when you see uh, rustic elements uh, on a storefront, to me, it seems out of place. Nils? <clears throat> well, I think that that's a broad subject when every supermarket in north of Albany looks exactly the same. When I say exactly, I mean exactly the same. I, I think that there's a loose understanding of what that is. It's become a fashion maybe. There are more stores where you can buy PVC uh, moose antlers in Connecticut and anywhere else in the world. The, the, it's a misunderstanding of what it could be, I think. It's a, it's a few curly cues placed on a box doesn't make architecture. Uh, architecture is a solid thought, and it includes how what goes on inside the building, what goes on outside the building, and what you expect approaching the building. And, and I don't expect everybody to understand that, because um, I think the liberal arts quotient my most average people is low. I don't know that being a snob here, but you know, you go directly from high school to med school or to law school. What do you learn before you enter those places? Very sad, I think. Thank you. I just want to finish this with one thing, and I'm sure Rich agrees, but maybe not. That I, except for one of our Patriots here who was not invited tonight has designed one sort of interesting uh, band shell in, in uh, Lake Placid. But I've been up here for since 95 and I've offered free design for, for all sorts of kind of stuff from visitor centers to ski lodges to uh, stuff like that, thousands of dollars of, of, of design money. Nobody is a bit interested except for some very few individuals that I know here that I don't, that don't have enough power. I'm just looking at the latest hotel in Saranac Lake, it's just one of them. It's, uh, it's an abomination. I mean, I, you know. It is. That, that, that prevails. Oh yeah, put this on bark here. No, 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 you're done. You don't need any more. Yeah, a little bit of uh, peel and stick uh, <laughs> ornamentalism just doesn't cut it uh, when there's no allegiance paid to scale, to mass, and you drive into town and you run into a billboard. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. With, uh, with that, I would like to ask both of you if you have any final comments to wrap up this evening's event. Summaries. Starting with you, Rich. Um, I, I've, um, I think I would like to make a comment about uh, some of the the uh, conversations I've had with uh, with clients and some with contractors, but to a lesser degree, of uh, people complaining about code compliance. Uh, that we're talking about life safety issues. And when there's a, a proper way to do a stairway and uh, you have uh, you know, needs for proper egress, fire safety, uh, squeezing uh, sleeping spaces into tiny houses uh, just drives me nuts. Um, so, I, I tend to think that the work that uh, Renee Poulin and I do here, and I'm sure Niels and, and Michael in their offices, that uh, we bring value to our, our projects and uh, provide protection for our clients and for the contractors. 
and that we're, we're the reasonable arbiters of uh, uh, discussions and decisions. Um, so I thoroughly enjoy the, the work that we do and thoroughly enjoy the, the people that we work with. Thank you. Niels? Well, <clears throat> Rich has said it all, but I'd like to say from my own personal point of view is I'm very happy when I can go to the office every day and design something that hasn't been done before. That is a very personal and selfish statement, but that's important to me. Okay, thank you both of you. And um, I believe um, Cheryl. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Jim, Niels and Rich. Um, it was really, this was so interesting and really appreciate the deep dive into some of the historical influences of the architecture that we all um, get to see and enjoy. So I'm Cheryl Bronstein. I am the Director of Interpretation at the Adirondack Experience. And I just wanted to give you all a heads up about a few programs that we have coming up. Next week, we close out our Adirondacks for All evening program series. There'll be a virtual symposium over three nights. And you can use the link that was just posted in the chat to find out more about those programs and to register. Our next um, Artist and Inspiration program will be on November 14th. The program will be a look at sporting art and featuring Claudia Pfeiffer from the National Sporting Library and Museum. And then we'll end the year with a special panel discussion on the status of the arts in the Adirondacks, featuring several artists and art leaders across the region. And this program will be moderated by NCPR's Mitch Tyke. Again, information on those programs is also in the chat. Um, so thank you again. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, and we just wish everybody a good fall and, and see you next month. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you.